Am I on? Okay. All right. Well, uh, welcome tonight. Hopefully, uh, everybody is doing well and uh, you're ready for winter time and uh, the election of the millennium. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, we're gonna we're gonna pick back up in Second Corinthians chapter one tonight. Uh, we had a good discussion last week. Remember, you know, if you have things to say, just uh, let me know you want to say them, and uh, and uh, we will share the time. <coughs> so, uh, anyway, anybody have any prayer requests tonight? No. Well, yes, sir. My um, brother has a coworker who's having some personal issues. Okay. Financial and otherwise. And Is it Brian? Yeah. The girl that works with him at St. Andrews. He actually used to work with her back in Colt, back home. Okay. Um, he's known her for about 15 years. Her name's Melissa. But she actually she just needs some general clarity. Any others? All right, well, let's open up in prayer. Dear Lord, we just want to ask that you be with us tonight as we study your word, that you'll guide us in its understanding, and uh, we ask uh, that you'd be with our country. We have an election coming up, and just uh, we know there's a lot of turmoil going on in, uh, within our borders, and we, uh, uh, we really need, uh, I guess, your, uh, your intervention to, uh, to solve a lot of our problems. Help us that we would look towards you and allow you to really help us to, to do those things that are right in accordance with your word and with your precepts. And Lord, I just ask that you'd also be with Melissa, that you would help her and uh, the things that she's going through and, and just uh, guide them, Lord, uh, in, a, in, in the way that they need to go. Uh, you know the issues, you know the details, and you know the answer. So I just ask, Lord, for you to, to intervene there also. Uh, guide us again in, in this study and help us to learn from your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians. We stopped at around a chat, uh, verse 12. And if you remember, uh, we, we talked about, you know, um, kind of experiencing a righteous correction in, uh, in our lives. Uh, you know, we all go through things, and, uh, you know, God uses the things that we go to to correct us uh, if we're going in a, in a wrong direction or even to prepare us for, uh, for something in the future. So it becomes important for us to be able to listen to, uh, to God whenever he's talking to us, and a lot of times he does talk to us through correction processes. So anyway, uh, that's what we talked about. And, uh, you know, a good study, uh, sometimes it's hard to, uh, to talk about such things because whenever you do, you start thinking about some things that you go through or you have gone through in your life and then some things that you know are coming your way. And uh, a lot of times there's some anxiety knowing, well, I know there's this hurdle coming up. You ever seen some of those videos where, where guys are, are they're, they're supposed to jump the hurdle? And sometimes they do it eloquently, and then other times they make it the funniest home videos. And, uh, you know, uh, I hate to say it, but sometimes that happens in our life, too, that uh, if, it, you know, if it didn't hurt so bad, it would be funny. Um, but, you know, we, we go through those things, and uh, that is, that's life. That's life. Jesus said, in this life you will suffer persecution. You don't get out of it just because you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You still have to live in this world. You still have to go through things. Bad things do happen to good people. And, uh, you know, even whenever you think ever, you're doing everything right, things happen. Sometimes you accidentally do some things wrong. You don't know that you're doing wrong. Yes, sir? May I offer a brief explanation on that? Sure. If Jesus took care of us and didn't let nothing bad happen to us, then some of us would line up for the goodies and wouldn't love him just because we love him. Uh, that's, that is true. Um, and, uh, we, and we would think that he's more like a genie in the lamp than, uh, 
you know, a suffering Savior on the cross. So, yeah, good, yeah, good point. Let's look in verses, uh, verse 13 of chapter 1, and uh, we'll just start there, and we'll read through verse 19. And y'all bear with me uh, as we get through some of these things, because, uh, I don't know, it is interesting, and the Apostle Paul is talking to the Corinthians. <clears throat> so anyway, for we write none of the things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. Now what he is referring to is 1 Corinthians. Has everyone read the 1 Corinthians? Raise your hand if you read 1 Corinthians. You know what's in it. What's in 1 Corinthians? The the, uh, there are some gifts there. The love chapter. Well, there is the love chapter, but there's a lot of not-so-loving chapters there where Paul, the Apostle Paul is dealing with some pretty rough things where there is disunity inside of the body of believers. And there's even one instance where there's a guy who married his father's wife. And then there's other ones that he's dealing with that they're living in open fornication. And he's dealing with those things. He's dealing with the misappropriation of the, of the gifts of the Spirit. And he's trying to tell them, like, you guys, you can't. Anyway, you have to read 1 Corinthians. He's getting on to them almost the whole chapter or the whole, the whole book. Now, there are some, some better things in there. The reason he wrote the love chapter is because they were being unloving. They didn't know how to love. They were, they were doing their own thing. They're like, well, we love who we want to love, but this person over here, they don't deserve it, so we're not loving them. So that's why he wrote those things. He was trying to help them to understand you're doing it all wrong. And he spends the whole book getting on to them. And he writes this, and he says, I hope that you will acknowledge that there's sin in the camp and deal with it. That's really what he's talking about there in verse 13. In verse 14, he says, As also you have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing. He's saying that you do acknowledge that we do preach the gospel and that we are anointed by God to do his will, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence, I was minded to come to you before that you might have a second benefit. He says, I would like to come. I wanted to come to you before. You knew I wanted to come so that I can talk to you face to face with these things. In verse 16, it says, And to pass by you unto Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and you to be brought on my way towards Judea. He's like, that you visiting you was a part of my plan. Uh, he hadn't made it yet. He just wrote a letter because of circumstance in his life. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness or the things that I propose, do I propose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay. And uh, I know, I understand, it's like, what in the world is Paul talking about? He's talking about how he would handle the situations that were there. He's like, when I wrote the letter, did it sound like I was being easy on you? And if you read it, he's not being easy on them. He's being pretty rough on them and trying to get them back. And he's like, this is... Uh, He's like, this is what I would do if I were you, and, but this is God's will. And, and, you know, you can read 1 Corinthians and you can see some of those things in it. But as God is true in verse 18, it says, Our word towards you was not yea and nay. So he's like, it's not going to, it wasn't based on like opinion. It's like, this is what God gave us according to his scripture. This is how you handle those situations. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, he, he taps back into some things that Jesus said, and we're going to look at those things in a minute. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, even by me and Savannah and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. So he's like, the, what I wrote to you is according to the things that Jesus taught. Not my ideas, not my, not my opinion, but these things were taught by Jesus. It says... Um, and it will, we'll, we'll stop right there. So really what he's doing is he's, he, you know, the first part we talked about the correction and some of the things that happened with that, and we had a good discussion on it. Um, but, whenever, but whenever a correction is coming, he, he's basically saying accept godly correction when you're experiencing it. When you start experiencing correction in your life, accept it. Don't fight against it. Don't rebel against it. 
accept God's correction in your life, it will go easier, um, when, especially when, you're, when you are experiencing these things. And you can, you'll know when you're experiencing them. Everybody know when you're experiencing correction? Yeah? You know, it's just like when your parents, for the kids, you know uh, you're experiencing correction when your parents raise their voice, right? Or when they take away uh, privileges, or maybe they're kind of sarcastic in their tone. That there's, you're experiencing some kind of a correction, but it's based on a case-by-case -case basis, right? They're not going to respond the same way for every single thing. Now, uh, you know, sometimes that they might even have a freak-out session. Anybody experienced that with their parents? That, that they, you just, you just got, you've gone nutso and you caused them to go nutso too? I know uh, mine have seen me. You know, those aren't, those aren't the best times I, when I lived in the flesh because, you know, it, 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 it seemed like to me that my kid was possessed by the devil himself and I was going to cast him out one way or another. Um, so anyway, maybe, maybe you've been through that yourself and uh, maybe you handle it right. Maybe, you know, maybe you, you didn't handle it right and you look back like, oh yeah, I really messed that one up. But, uh, you know, it's usually by a case-by-case -case basis and you try to figure out how to handle it. Um, now, whenever you do it, Paul is, Paul is kind of expressing here, you know, you know me, I know you. And that makes a difference on how you're going to accept that correction from somebody. And unfortunately, in this life, you're going to experience correction from not just your parents, but you're, sometimes you're going to experience correction from your friends. Sometimes you're going to experience correction from, uh, you know, uh, a pastor, maybe a counselor, maybe an employer. You know, it comes in all kinds of ways. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, some no-name person just makes a comment in the, in the line at the store. That just depends. It's a case by case. How well do you know the person? Uh, the position of the person you might get corrected by an officer one day You know if you're speeding down the road and you see the blue lights behind you you can expect some immediate correction, right? <laughs> He's gonna talk to you about what you did wrong uh, So here's a and here's another thing that Apostle Paul talks about is that it's not helpful to beat around the bush He's like it's not nay nay or yay yay. It's like I'm not beating around the bush here um, You know uh, different personal ideas or even personal boundaries. He's like um, this isn't what I would do if I were you or, or something like that. He's like these he offers what the Bible prescribes Isn't because we're all different right? The way that you're gonna handle certain things going wrong in your life are gonna be maybe different than what the way I hand I would handle the same thing because it affects me different So those are some of the things that he's talking about but for sure when it's a when uh, the scripture talks, Jesus gave us an, an example on how to deal with these things uh, the, the best way, especially inside the church. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. So Matthew chapter 18, look at verse 15. Jesus is teaching here um, because the disciples, they're already dealing with some stuff. And Jesus is teaching them, this is how you deal with issues when they come up. It says, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. That is what 1 Corinthians does. Paul actually talks to them directly. These things in your life are not good. You need to do something about them. And he goes on to explain the, way, the right way to handle some things and what some of these things are even about, like the gifts of the Spirit. He, they, were, they were not using them right. You know, a lot of people will use 1 Corinthians to establish the doctrine of the, you know, speaking in tongues and don't use 1 Corinthians for that because they were doing it wrong. If you're doing it like they're doing it, you just you messed up. You're messing up. You're, you're actually sinning. You're violating 
the gift of, that God has given to you. If you're doing it the way the first Corinthians did, the Apostle Paul says, this is what it is. There's no gift that's better than another gift. And then even some of those other gifts are used for certain things. That, that's just, you have to read what he wrote. Is that where he talks about, you know, like what good is the, the hand without the, or the, you know, the mouth without the, without the eyes and that kind of stuff? So I think it is. I think it is. He even gets on to them because... Talks about being yeah. the body of Christ. And all that. Yeah, the body of Christ wasn't functioning like the body. They were, they were acting as individuals. And he, and he was telling them, you know, just like in most churches that you go to, uh, 20% do all, do all the work, and the 80%, they warm the pews. And the Apostle Paul is dealing with that. He's like, it, it, should not be, it should not be like that. Everybody should have a ministry inside of it. You know, this person should not be the hands, the feet, the toes, and all that, and you're, you're nothing. You're, you're, you've got a gift. You need to contribute your gift into it as much as possible. That's, that's what he's trying to explain to them. And so that's why you should find a place and, and try to do something, you know, to, for the sake of benefiting, benefiting someone else. So anyway, that's what's going on in 1 Corinthians. Jesus said if anybody has, um, you know, if, they, if, he does, if he is messing up, go and talk to him. Just like, hey, have you considered this? That it, that's not the right response. That's not the right way you should do it. Verse 16 says, But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee two or more, and that the mouth of two or, two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So if you know that they're, they're really messing up and they won't listen, well, get a couple more people to say it. And you, don't, and you know you don't do it publicly, you do it privately. And you try to talk, and you try to, talk to that person, hey, this is not good, What's, what, what we're seeing, this is not good, what what you're doing or you're not handling this correctly. And like I said, sometimes it's a case-by-case -case basis. You know, I've, there's been a, a few times I've, uh, I've, I've corrected people without them even knowing that they're being corrected. You know, that's, that's when it, sometimes you just have to do that because of the, of the fragile state of the person. And you just have to, you know, ease into that like this. You know, you, you, really, you really should uh, do this. I'm not going to reference anything because somebody are like, oh, that's what you were doing? And anyway, so don't want to give away all my secrets. But you get two or three together, and it says in verse 17, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So there gets to a point that if they will not listen at all, if they will not try that you take, you may, you go public with it. Um, that is not all. You know, there's there's a time and a place for all those things. Um, you know, I've seen sometimes when uh, you know uh, there's a couple teenagers who ended up having an inappropriate relationship, and they made the they, the first thing that they made them do was go before the church and announce their sin, and I totally disagree with that. I don't think that that's in the scripture to do that. I think you go and talk to them personally and you say, listen, that needs to end. And you don't make a public example of them. You try, you try to get them to want to amend their lives I mean, to God's word first. They probably wouldn't do the same thing with adults. They would probably would keep it secret with adults that they call out the kids. To, right, you know, the young right. People. And, and you know, and uh, there's a level of hypocrisy there. Yeah, you you really want as much correction privately as possible. That's what Jesus says. That's not me. Going to the extreme measure first to make a public example of somebody is the wrong way to do it. It is much better for God to do it than for you to do it. Does that make sense? If God can fix you, I know you'll be fixed. But if I try to force you into being fixed well you you should see this some of the you know some of the the southern engineering that i've done in my life okay duct tape just doesn't fix people right yes sir sometimes it takes years for your correction to take root. it does you're absolutely right brother bill sometimes you know this is this is what you look like in a person's correction does it does the problem bother them are they trying you know if it bothers them and they're trying 
you don't go public with that. You let God do what he does best. You let God fix that. You don't want to try to, every time man puts his hands into the pot, he messes it up. He should, man should actually social distance from God's, from what God is doing. Okay? Let God do what he does best. He heals. All, all I've seen what man does is, is wound another, even when they're not trying to. They, when, they try to when they try to help God out, they make it worse. And that's what we, we need to see. Is God working in the situation? If God's working in that situation, man, how can I encourage them? Hey, I'm praying for you. You shoot them a text. Hey, hope you're doing okay. I'm thinking about you. You know, those sorts of encouraging things. Even though you may know every single thing that's going on, you're not going to make it public. You're not going to bring it out. You're going to let God work what he does best. Does that make sense? And I know that's probably not standard Baptist teaching, is it, Brother Bill? But uh, that's what I see from God's word. And you know what? Baptists like that church discipline. Yeah. Well, I like God discipline because he doesn't make my sin public. <laughs> Thank goodness. Uh, you know, he works on me. And, and and he doesn't, and I don't think he says, you know, go and announce your gossip to the to the world. No, he says go to your closet. Get it done. Now there should be some people in your life that you know they're 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 you have total confidence in them that they really know what's going on. You could talk to them maybe a little bit. Don't tell them everything, you know, uh, unless you just really feel like that need. But if you have to get it off your chest. But anyway, uh, usually you can keep it generic and just say, hey, I really need you to pray for me for this. And then and they don't have to know all the details. Yes, sir. Sometimes Jesus, Jesus doesn't operate on the same time frame as we do. Uh, sometimes Jesus might let you go 50 years before he brings your sin to your mind and discipline you. Yep. We're, and we're going to talk about some of those things here in a minute, too. That it does it does take some time uh, sometimes. Sometimes it's like that. All the times, it's like um, you got a, it's like a, 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 you know, a wound, a mortal wound in you. And uh, and it's going to leave a mark. It's going to leave a scar. Thorn in the flesh. Yeah. You know, uh, um I, I cut my I cut my hand right here one time pretty deep. I should have went and got stitches. I never did. It took about three months for that for that to scar up. Okay. Well, it's when the weather moves in, it's still I still feel that it's there, um, and uh, and it's I mean there was even a, a kind of a, a scab over it for over a year. Sometimes there's things in your lives that take a long time to heal. And it's going to leave a scar. It's going to leave a mark. And, you know, sometimes those are okay. You just got to know, I'm forgiven. God can heal me, but you know what? There is some scar tissue in my life. And, uh, you know, those, those would be a remit. You know, every time I, I look at that, I, re, I, re, I am reminded, do not pull the knife towards you. <laughs> you know? Uh, anyway, so... Uh, and let me see, where are we at? Verse uh, 18, it says, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Amen. Okay, now this is talking about, what are, what's the context that we were talking about? In, uh, the ter- in correction. Correction. Yeah. yeah, when you know I've got this issue, and you want it fixed so bad in your life, you know it's wrong. He says, whatever two or three are gathered and they bind it, it is bound. You know, if you really have an issue, you're like, I need this healed in my life. You go get yourself two or three people. And it says that, that, two or, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. This is not. This is not talking about the you disciplining them. It's talking about you helping them through the healing process. Does that make sense? That's what Jesus is talking about here. I know that's not what it's often taught as here, 
but you you read the context, it's totally about yeah. somebody getting something those, fixed those in their life. Those verses are taken out of context way too often by a lot of mainstream preaching. Yep. Look at the, the last verse there in 20. It says, where, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, for the, this is what it, the context, for the purpose of healing in that person's life, for correction, that they need this done, there I am in the midst of them. I agree with those people. I agree with them. Okay? Does that make sense? So ex that means that when we experience correction in our life, accept it. If you're struggling to accept it, Find yourself two or three people and say, I really need some help in this area of my life. Help me bind it. Help me get this taken care of. Help me to be healed from it. Sometimes it's a process, but you know what? You get those two or three people together, you're going to make friends for life. Like, not only will the problem be bound, but you also will be bound. It, it, it's a God thing. It really is a God thing. When the Holy Spirit inside of you bonds with another Holy Spirit inside of another person, it's a unique experience that is bound in heaven. Okay? So, I'm going to press on. Um, back to any, any further comments on that? If not, let's go back to first, uh, 2 Corinthians. Look back at verses 18 and 19 here. It says, but as God is true, our word towards you was not yea and nay, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us. Okay, so here, one of the best ways to experience correction in a very private way is through preaching. Now, here's the thing about experiencing it through preaching. You have to submit yourself to preaching. In Romans, it says that it's the foolishness of preaching. And I trust me, when I get up here and I'm preaching, I feel very foolish sometimes. I'm like, what in the world is up with that? But, you know, it's, it's through the foolishness of preaching that sometimes the best correction comes to us. Where God will talk to you in a way that through, through whatever words that the guy is saying, that you are hearing what you need to hear. And it may not even be on the same subject that we're talking about, but you hear the correction that God is trying to send your way because you have submitted yourself to the authority of God's word. And God will talk to you and to your, to your conscience, and you're thinking one thing when he may, he may be on a something totally different. Okay? So the preaching is often of the best source of correction. However, you do have to be under preaching for that to happen. So... Any, any more comments on that before I press on to the, to the next thing about those who accept going through this correction process? All right, so let's look at the next verses, 20 through, uh, uh, through the rest of the verses here. We're going to just take them one at a time. That those who accept going through things and the correction that God is trying to do, God gives you, there are some benefits to it. Uh, and these are the benefits that the Apostle Paul lists. Look in verse 20 with me. He says, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. So those who accept going through things and correction, God gives them the promises of God. Does that, do y'all understand that? Galatians 3 and 22, it says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So he, he says, I'm promising you something. If, you'll, if you will respond appropriately to the correction, I'm giving you a promise. I'm going to get you through it. You're not going to, you, don't, you can have peace through the process. It's kind of like uh, what he said in Romans that we, you know, if we're, if we're walking in the Spirit and we're truly children of God, then we become, we get elevated to, to join heirs of Christ. So we receive the promises of the Father. Right. Like, you know, as an inheritance. Right. Through faith. You know, you know, one of the things, and this is God's, this is God's promise to you, that despite your past, it's not going to affect your future in Him. That's a promise. Everyone who's in Christ is a new creature. You're a new creature. He doesn't look at you the same. Whatever, whatever, whatever you think that you were in the past, you're not the same in His eyes. He, he looks at you, He's like, you're born again. 
You're something different. Yeah, maybe you have some scars in this life, but know this. When you, go to, when you die and you go to heaven, one day God's going to give you a new body. All those scars are going to be gone. In the book of Revelation, he even says that he's going to wipe every tear from your eye. What does that mean? That all that pain from the past, he's going to wipe it away. That memory is going to be gone. You're not going to have to hold on to those failed times in your life. He says this. He says, though, uh, you know, the, though the sins are many, he'll blot them out. He says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out just looking at thy transgressions for mine exactly own sake and will not remember thy sins. He blots out those things. When you get to heaven, you're not going to remember all your failures from your past. Do you understand that? It's going to... This life is nothing like what you're going to experience in the next. That's a promise. And, you're, and if you will accept that a correction now, that's a promise. You know, and we all have that process that we have to go through, but just know the promises are yours. Accept it. Sometimes it hurts. I get it. The correction process sometimes hurts. Accept it and try to do better the next time. Let him work in you what he does best. Any more thoughts on that? Look at verse 21. It says, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ hath anointed us is God. So the, ne uh, the next benefit to accepting that correction in your life is being established in the faith. Hebrews 13, 8 and 9 says it like this. Jesus Christ, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Be not carried away with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing <coughs> that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them, but have been occupied therein. What he's saying is, understand what God is teaching. Be established in the faith. Don't, don't give in to all these winds of doctrines and teachings that... Um, the, the adding to God's word, um, extra laws and stuff. We, there's already enough rules that God has given. We don't need extra. Does that make sense? You know, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of places they get caught up on, well, the type of clothes that you wear. Or, um, you know, a, a lot of times they even, they even pick on ladies. Well, you've got, you know, you've got to... Wear your hair up. You gotta wear your hair down. You gotta wear a dress. Um, a head covering. A head covering. Um, even sometimes for the guys, you know, they're they're like, you gotta do this. Listen, what God teaches on that is modesty. He's like, just make sure you're covered. That's what He teaches on that. He's not looking at, are you wearing a button-up shirt? You wearing a tie? Are you wearing a t-shirt and and jeans? Maybe you're wearing a pair of shorts. Whatever. Just as long as we don't, you know, you're not flaunting yourself. You're being modest. That's what it teaches on that. We don't have to add to the rules. That's just one. Another thing is, well, we've got to do, we have to do communion like this. If we don't do it like this, it's not going to work. And they add to it. They add to it things that aren't, aren't there. And we don't have to do those extra things. We look at the scripture. God says he's the same yesterday, today, today. And forever. If you want to know how he is, look at the past. He's not changing his mind about all these extra things. He's not trying to add extra rules to it. We don't have to be established in the faith. What does the scripture say about it? The just live by faith. Okay? I trust God that he's going to get me through all these things. I take his, what does he say? What, another thing about faith is I got to trust his word. I got to believe it. I believe every word of this. Do I understand it all? I don't understand it all. But if he says do it in this, I do it. This is, you know, churches should uh, should make sure that this is their covenant, not a not a not a placard on the wall. A lot of times they go by the placard on the wall rather than rather than this. This should be our guide, not how we do business meetings. Okay, we need to be established in this. I've known a bunch of people that they, they've got their covenant memorized better than the word, God's word. There's a problem there. And he says, be established in the faith. This is profitable for
for doctrine and correction in righteousness. Does that make sense? Be established in the faith. Now, if you struggle with faith, here's what the Bible says. If you need more faith, get more of his word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you're struggling with faith, get in God's word a little bit more. Even if you don't understand it, keep stay in it. Be strong in it. Grow in it. Any questions on that? The part where it says, and hath anointed us as God, mm -hmm. that's talking about the sitting of the Holy Spirit. It is. Yeah, that's actually my next point. So thank you, Brother Austin, for getting me right there. Anointed by God. That's, a, that's another benefit of the correction process is that he anoints you. He gives you more of that spirit. You know, uh, we think, you know, I, well, as soon as you're saved, you get the Holy Spirit, right? But there's, there's something about giving in to God and his, and, and his correction process that it's like the Holy Spirit becomes stronger inside of us. And he can anoint us to do even, even more things. And in Luke 13, 49, he, Jesus says like this, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So you wonder sometimes, I don't see how I'm going to be able to get through the process that God is sending me through. And you're going to want to give up sometimes. It's, or you're going to think, it's not worth it. God will give you the strength to get through it. And, he, and you know, there's a, I think it's kind of a false teaching out there that says that God will not put on you more than you can handle. God always puts on you more than you can handle. Doesn't he, Brother Bill? There's a bunch of things. The longer you live, the more times you experience, well, he wants us I can't to, get through this. He wants us to have to lean on him. He wants that's, you to have to lean on him. That's why we endure those things, is because we can't do it ourselves. Yep. Realizing that is part of as part of submitting to, to God. Right. And, and, you know, being able to rely on him 100%, that's called faith. Mm -hmm. You don't know you. You're like, I can't see the way out. That's good. When you know there is only one way for me to make it through this, and that's God, you're in a good position. You don't have any other choice but to turn to him. Yeah, when you have Noah, and you know a lot of times that's when people get saved. is because they've tried every avenue, and they are lower than they, they, they can't get any lower. Death is the next step, and they, and they have no choice but to either die or look up. And when they look up, you know what they see? They see Jesus. They see hope. Reaching now like he did for, uh, oh, what's his name? For Stephen? Stephen, yeah. Was, that image of Stephen getting yanked out of his body right before he died. Right. And getting stoned. Just, that, that always, I don't know, for some reason that comforts me. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, yeah. me too, brother. Stephen me too. says he looks up and gets jerked out before he even endures the, the, the pain. Yeah, one of the things about people that accept his correction and they're anointed with the Holy Spirit is that they witness miracles in their life. And I believe in miracles. Amen. I have seen miracles in my own life. I anticipate more miracles to come in my life. And I don't believe he has used all of his miracles up on me. I believe that he has reserved one or two for you guys also. <laughs> that the, so accept it. Accept the anointing with the Holy Spirit comes God's power from on high. You know what he, what Jesus excels in? Miracles. Look, read, read the letters in red. What did Jesus do all the time? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He made the blind see. So you said when we were going through Luke, you said that Jesus never met a funeral that he didn't run. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus never met a funeral he, he didn't run. Yeah, he didn't ever come across a funeral procession <laughs> that he didn't interrupt. <laughs> yeah, he, he ruins every funeral with a resurrection. <laughs> You know, when, you fear, when you're experiencing a funeral in your life, you're like, you know, this part of my life is dead. Watch him raise something up even better. And, be in it, and anticipate it. Listen, if you're, if you're living for him, expect resurrections in your life. Okay? Whether it's, whether it's older relationships with family and, and, and friends, you might even see some of, the, some of your friends from the past get right with God. I'm keeping tabs on uh, on one of them that I have uh, from.
from when I, I went to Sunday school with this, with this lady. And, you know, she, her life got just ruined. It turned into a mess. And now she is, ex I'll get you in a second, buddy, okay? And, and I saw today that she is graduating from this uh, women's ministry uh, rehab center, and her life is just turning around. Some of the things that were that were uh, lost in her past, she is regaining those with her with the, with her own child, with her grandchild. Um, so God still works, and you know, and just just seeing that is just a, a marvelous thing. I've seen it with the the life of my nephew, that he is, his life has turned around, and God is God's blessing it. And you've got to wonder why would He do that? Well. God cares about you and He loves you, and He's not done with you yet. If you're still, if you're, if you're still killing oxygen cells and making carbon dioxide, God still loves you, and He still has a purpose for your life and a plan. Just accept it whenever He's He's trying to fix you, brother Ben. You, what do you got to say, man? Did you forget? Jesus died on the cross for us. He sure did. That'll preach every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so we're we're anointed by God in verse twenty two. Look what look what it says: Who hath sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit towards our heart? Um, you know, God is God doesn't give you the these promises. He doesn't give you what you need to get through the process and then take it away from you. He seals it inside of you. That Holy Spirit of promise, he actually, this says he has sealed you with it. He's not going to take it back. Those who have accepted his correction, he seals them. If you, if you want to know kind of what that looks like, or I think Revelation chapter, uh, oh goodness, 7 or 8, it talks about God seals 144,000 of the, of the Hebrews. And I don't think it's just them that he has sealed. I think I think he sealed other people too. He just kind of he just during that time he reaches out and he just says, "I'm sealing these guys just like I sealed you." How do you get sealed? Well, you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, and he says, "You're no longer yours. You're mine. You're bought with a price." The Apostle Paul says. We even have a song about it. He sought me. He bought me. He's always trying to reach out to you. It doesn't matter how, if you're still alive, he's trying to reach you. Now, sometimes we become, people become like Pharaoh, and they just harden themselves so much that they become unreachable, but that doesn't have to be the same. The, it doesn't have to be that way for you. You know, what if Pharaoh had said, I'm going to accept the correction that God's given on me? What would that have done to Egypt? It would have saved thousands and thousands of lives. Well, God's wanting to do that to you too. Say yes to him. You don't know that through you surrendering to the, his correction that thousands and thousands of people might be saved. Make sense? Verse, Ephesians 1.13, it says, In whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So if you're wondering where I got the sealed with the Holy Spirit, this is, this is it right here, that you were sealed with it. You ever, have you ever seen something that was sealed? Like a can, like a, like a can you brought from the store? Yeah, how hard is it to, uh, to open? You know, you can bang that thing around, you can drop it, and it stays, it stays together, doesn't it? Well, that's kind of how the Holy Spirit is inside of you. There's only one way for it to come out, and that's it. And that's with a can opener. God owns the only can opener. You can't do it. You're not strong enough. Yes, sir. I'm not sure y'all would agree with this, but I think it's I think it's a really little difficult for us to really grasp the enormity of, we know that, and, and you mentioned it a little while ago, about when we're saved, we get Jesus' his Holy Spirit. I think, what, I think what goes over our heads 
maybe even on a subconscious level, so much of the time is how complete that is. There, Jesus made our little peanut brains, and he knows exactly what goes on inside of them. We don't hide anything from the Lord Jesus. Everything that we think about, he knows. If we could keep that truth in the forefront of our, the way we live our lives, it could make such a difference. But we hold out stuff. We keep little corners private that we hide stuff, we think. Yep. Says the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch over the evil and the good. Yep. It, yeah, he, and you know, and that's, you know, whenever whenever you do have problems, another thing about this is that you can know you're not alone. You're not alone in this. That God's with you. Despite what you may feel at the time, you know, there's a, there's a, a poem that was written t- called The Footprints in the Sand. Is it, everybody familiar with that? Yeah. The, you know, the, as the poem goes, that the person, you know, sees two... Through his life, he, he sees two sets of footprints. But then when he gets to the, the part of his life that was the most traumatic, he looks down and he's like, there's only one set of tracks there. And he asks Jesus, like, why, was there only two? why weren't you there with me when I was going through that? And he's like, I was. I was carrying you. And, you know, and that's, that's really what's going on. And, uh, and, and some of us will experience some more traumatic things than, than others. Um, but we all will go through some things. But just know you're not alone in it. That whenever it seems like it's the worst and you feel and you feel like you're alone, you're not alone. You're never alone. But you get but you gotta keep faith. You gotta keep your mind right because the devil's gonna tell you you're not worth it. That God doesn't love you anymore. And none of those things are true. None of those things are true. Look at verse 22 with me. He says where the that he you are sealed, but then he gives the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. Anybody know what the word earnest means? What does earnest mean? Earnest money. Earnest money. What is earnest money, brother Bill? Well, it shows you're serious about it. Yeah, it's the down payment, right? Mm-hmm. It it's, it it says this is what this is what I'm putting forward to say I'm going to follow through with something better to come. And that's what, that's what he's saying right now. He's like, right now, when, whenever, whenever you're going through this process of, of correction, God invests in you. He puts something down, the Holy Spirit. And once you get through that correction process, there's something better on the other side. You know, if you've ever gone through uh, buying a house, one of the things that you, you're going to do is you're going to put down an earnest payment. You're going to put a percentage down on the house. And you're going to go through the next month and a half of people getting in your business. They're going to be looking. They're going to be asking for your finance records. They're going to be calling your employers. They're going to be talking to all kinds of people. They're going to look at your credit. How bad have you been with your money? And they're going to examine your life. And you're going to be put through a process. And then you're going to have to sign a stack of paperwork that's as thick as the Bible on it. And it's about as many words, I think. But when you're done, you've got something much better than the earnest on the other side. You've got something that has value, that's going to grow in value. A place where you can live. A place that you're going to have memories. Better memories. A place that you could call your own and you're going to say, this is home. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit kind of is to you, too. When you're going through it, there's an earnest that's, that's given. But if, once you make it through, there's something better on the other side. And you've got to have confidence that it's worth it. If you don't, you can give up. You can fail. But don't. Hang in there. There's something better waiting for you. If you can believe it. If you can accept it. If you can have faith. And God will get you through John 14, 22 says it like this. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he is, 
He it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved in my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. You know, um, I've heard this called the, the victorious uh, Christian life verse. Because whenever you're going through things, God's going to God's gonna show you something. He's going to say, this is how you fix it. And you accept the commandment from him, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to apply this in my life to fix this issue. And once that's fixed, he says, and, it, and because you do it, you do it because you love him, right? And he says, you're, when you accept that, you're loved of my Father. And then he says, I'm going to manifest myself to you. So he's going to show you more about himself. He's going to show you more. You think, you think when, you're, when you're saved that you know everything about Jesus? You don't. But as you go through this process, God shows you more and more and more about who he really is. Not only who he really is, but who he can be in your life. Even who he is in your life. So what, is it, what does it look like? Well, as a newborn Christian, you know, I've got some things I've got to fix in my life. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to apply God's correction in my life. I'm going to accept his commandment. I'm going to allow him to fix me because I love him. Because he died on the cross for me, just like, just like our brother Ben said. And then once we get through that process, we get on the other side. I'm like, okay, I made it. And then we go through something else. And we, and we begin to see how big of a God that he really is. And by the time you're around 82 years old, he should be the God of the universe in your life. Like there is nothing too difficult for him. And you know he can get you through. You know, whenever you're a young Christian, you should, you're going to struggle. Like I just don't know if, I just don't know if God can get me through this. Well, he can. The older you get as a Christian, the more ingrained in it you know you it's more than an earnest statement in your payment now it is what it is what makes up your memory your life and god has manifest himself to you over and over and shown you so much more about himself every time you go through it he gives you more every time he gives you more and you when you get to the end of your life you look back and you're like you'll be like the psalmist i've seen so many things but I've never seen the righteous alone. I've never seen the righteous in need. God is always taking care of them. Even when they look like they had nothing, they had everything. And they don't look at this world the same as what people in this world do. They look at it in a, from a different perspective, a different sight. And they're like, you know, you could give me all the money in this world, but... I've got more waiting for me in heaven. The biggest house here is not, it's not even in comparison to what God's, to my, my, my little shack that God's prepared for me in heaven. My, my apartment. Condo. My apartment, my condo in heaven. <laughs> so just think about that. Then whenever you're going through some things, God's there. So keep these things in mind. He gives promises to those who accept his, his correction. He will establish you in the faith. You're a, he will anoint you with the power that you need to get through it. He, you are going to be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And there is so much more to come. The earnest is now. You're going to get something better is coming. Yes, sir, Brother Sean. Um, I, I just wanted to say something before we close. Um, okay. You, know, you were talking earlier about um, our, our trust in God and Affects whether or not other people come mm -hmm. to him or, or you know receive the gospel, and um, you know you guys that are young, if, and even if you're not young, if you're waiting or not sure, or hadn't made your decision for Christ, don't wait because I you know I, I can tell you from my own personal testimony I spent half my life living like a heathen, and I finally came to the Lord you know two or three years ago, four years ago. And uh, I look back and I wonder if I had made the decision earlier, uh, how many of my friends and family who are probably in hell right now which might not be if I had been living my life the way I should have been. It's something you don't want to look back on and regret. Um, so if you're, if you're teeter tottering about making that decision, don't, don't wait. Sir, Brother Bill. This might be an appropriate time to approach a short, simple little statement declaration. 
Everybody's familiar with it. But I got to tell you, chapter and verse where it says, you could ask me with that. Very simply, it says that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does, what does that really mean? That means um, God is the one who's in control of everything. What, we just gotta, we just gotta let him be you, our God, let him be our do, Lord. What do you surrender when you make that simple statement? If you believe it's true, yeah. Well, it, you know, like in the Book of Revelation, you know, you you let him be Lord, and you let him be King. Like uh, Romans ten, nine and ten says that we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and we believe that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. That when we confess that he's Lord, we're saying, I don't belong to myself anymore. I, I belong to him. Bond servant or a slave? A slave. Yep. You but say, I'm a slave to him. Why is that idea so often lost by the world? They, it, it's, it's so easy to flippantly say, Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. But not mean it. I think it's because the gospel's been so watered down. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, people wanna people wanna hold they wanna be in control of their life. Mm -hmm. But they don't realize that when uh, when you work for the God of the universe, the benefits are much more than what you have. Because on my own, I can only do this much. Uh, you know, when I was in Utah, I experienced something very similar to that. You know, as a staff sergeant in the Air Force, I didn't have much authority. People told me what to do. But the commander had me working for him. And you know what that meant? People had to listen to what I said because I worked for the commander. And if they didn't, they were in trouble. All I had to do was go say their name to the boss, and it was on, and uh, it was not a good day for them. <laughs> Listen, when God, when Jesus Christ is your Lord and he's your king, you work for the boss. But and you, what, don't, you don't have any rights. Who needs rights when you have it all? People don't like <laughs> to give up their rights, though. Mm -hmm. Yep, rights are... Uh, well, what they don't realize, though, is that, you know, they have a problem with the idea of being a, being a, a bond servant to Christ, but they don't realize that they're already a slave to their sin. And to, and to the devil, and if you if you don't have any, then you, you're serving one or two masters. You know, it's just choosing which one you want to serve, whether you realize it or not. Yeah, Jesus said the truth will make you free. Uh, rejecting the truth that Jesus is is Lord and King, uh, you're actually living in a, in a in a you know in a slavery of a of a different sense. But when you make yourself a slave to Jesus, He says. The reward, the you reward, are, he the says you're set free. Is indescribable. Yep. You know, one of the things uh, that we saw during, prior to the Civil War is that we saw some people that were slaves, and they were led away from the South up North. But if they ever got caught, they were still slaves. But then there were some of those guys who were released by their slave owners. Those guys were free indeed. They didn't have to run. They didn't have to continually run from, from their past. They were released, and that's what Jesus Christ does to you. Though you sell yourself to Him, He releases you yeah, he into says freedom. In John eight it says, "Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but a son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, then you shall be free indeed." Yep. So, yeah, it's tough for some people to accept. But you know that's what this that's what this process that First Corinthians or Second Corinthians chapter one talks about. Man, if we would just accept His correction in our life, He'll do such great things with our life. So, any final thoughts? I like to think about it as taking up arms. Uh, you know, as a brethren in Christ, you know, He He brought the sword of the Spirit, and so we're choosing what side we're fighting on, and. And back in that day, you know, you know, people got called Lord regularly. Mm -hmm. You know, if they were a landowner and uh, they had some servants, those servants called that person Lord. You know, 
Right. And and so that's the idea is that we're calling Jesus Lord. He he is the landowner, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we're serving him. He has the deed, that's for sure. Yeah. Yep. And there there's a, so much into that. That's mm -hmm. that's a deep subject. Anything else? All right. Well, let's close in prayer, Brother Bill. Would you want? Would you mind dismissing us? Gracious Lord, we bow before you this evening, just lifting up praises to you for what a great and mighty and loving and forgiving God you are. We we can never fully understand the depth of your love. You created us in love. You didn't need us, you wanted us, Lord. You, you, you are so mighty, we can never fully grasp how great you are. You spoke, and you spread the stars across the heavens. Your servant commented that you not only knew how many stars there were, but you knew them by name. Your grandeur, your greatness just overwhelms us, Lord Jesus. We are so humble by the idea that you love us and you went to all this trouble for us. You are truly a great and mighty and loving God Pray that you make each person here tonight feel your presence in a very special way. Go with us from this place. Rest us tonight and awake us in the morning refreshed and ready for the blessings that the new day has. We pray these things in your name.